for? The blood he gave. The blood he gave. Green is for? The grass he made. Say happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah, the sun is so, so bright. Oh, I just showed it in some Right before it gets the main. Right before he breaks the day. Purple is for his hour of sun. Pink is for our new tomorrow. Jesus came to show us how to live and love on earth right now. Then he died to erase our sin. So the pearly gate would let us in. Raised from death, Jesus our God through our own death to the other side. Believe in Jesus and you will be written in the book of eternity. Easter means in heaven, life, free from sadness, free from strife. If your name is in God, it's journal. You are issued of life eternal. It's impossible to have any other who could suffer, die, be resurrected, and give an eternal gift to humankind. That's Jesus. That's Easter. Without Easter, there would be no hope of heaven without the hope of heaven. There would be no repentance, no personal, no transformation, no attempt to follow biblical principles. Without Easter, the world would be in chaos and darkness. Jesus' death and resurrection means we can be born to live better, to do better, to shine light into the shadow. Hallelujah. Happy, happy Easter. On Easter morning, we celebrate our Savior. Whatever people seek in Him, they find. In history, there has never been another so holy, sacrificial, good, and kind. His resurrection makes us all immortal. In heaven, we'll be together with the King, eternally sharing with all his blessings. Happy Easter! Jesus Christ is everything! If not for Easter, if not for Easter, the chaos of this world will be all there is and all there will ever be.
Well, hello, everybody. Great morning. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Well, this is First Lady Cecilia Matthews, and I'm so excited to see you guys this morning. Well, kind of, sort of. This is kind of really getting bad. I really wish I could be with you. Um, but this is going to be a powerful resurrection experience. Are you excited, babe? I am very, very excited. And I'm very excited about all of you that have gotten up extremely early for this worship experience. Uh, we know that we had some saints that are accustomed to sunrise services. So Ooh. hopefully you got your rice and your, uh, your breakfast or whatever you're going to eat this morning. And you're ready for a powerful, powerful uh, Sunday morning resurrection experience.
everybody excited that they get the opportunity to serve a living God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to take a few moments and to lift up thanks to him. When he sacrificed his life for us so that we might live and have life more abundantly, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You have the victory.
Oh my gosh, that's so powerful. Yes, victory does belong to our God. I need you to do this with me. I need you to touch those people that are right beside you. Touch your family and tell them victory belongs to Jesus. All right, you guys, get ready. I pray that you have prepared your hearts. I need you to get your Bible out. I need you to go and grab all the children from the back room because I know they've kind of been watching for a little while. I want them to get ready for our amazing Sunday experience as we have a message entitled, Hello from the other side. Every person has a story to tell. Like a tapestry woven together, every thread of the story serves a purpose. This is the story of Peter, a simple fisherman that made an immediate life-changing decision to leave all to follow Jesus. No questions asked. He dropped his nets and became a fisher of men. Join me as Peter conveys his side of the story. Well, Peter, how are you today, man? I'm doing good, thank you for having me. Excellent, excellent. Well. I'm excited. I've been reviewing our notes from our previous conversation and yeah. I'm just so excited to see you uh, have the courage to confront your story and uh, walk through your journey. And uh, I want you to know that just based on what we've we've heard so far, I see you getting to the other side of this. I appreciate that. I so appreciate got a question that. before we get started. Okay. Um, did you have an opportunity to fill out the paperwork that allows us to record our conversation? I did. I turned that in before I came in this Good. last time so secretary has it. excellent excellent yeah. well i really feel like you know being able to track this journey is going to be powerful so i want you to be able and i want to be able to just see your growth through this process because i'm sure some great things are going to happen so yeah. you ready to talk okay yeah let's do it let's do it all right good good all right so we're talking about this journey mm -hmm. this life altering journey you took uh, when you met Jesus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So talk to me about when you first met him. It's all it's it's kinda of almost hard to put into words, but you know I was I was a fisherman, I had my own thing, entrepreneur, you know, I'm I'm killing it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm pretty good. Mm hmm But I didn't really you know I it didn't feel like I was getting really to where I needed to go. Mm hmm And uh he walks up, man, and he just he just starts talking, and what he was saying and how he was saying, like it just like grabbed me, and I just I just left everything. I got a question for you. So when he walks up, you know, and obviously he comes and he says, "What does he say? What does he say to you when he when he comes?" He just like you no longer will be like a fish of fish. You'll be a fisher of men. Wow. And it like, it almost as if the things that I had been thinking, yeah, it just kind of came alive. And I was like, well, that's it. Well, that so he it. spoke to a part of you that probably no one else even knew Nobody. Was, was resident. Nobody. Wow. wow, that's amazing. So let me ask you this. So he comes and he says to you, you're not going to fish for fish anymore. Obviously, you've been an entrepreneur. This has been your journey of life right yep and you've got to leave everything to follow him so yeah so how does your family respond to that what's funny is my brother was there with me mm -hmm. so this was kind of kind of an interesting experience so he's sitting there with me and then jesus walks up and he grabs him too so it's like me and him that's that's my bro so we rolling together, ride or die, Powerful. you know, forever. My family, they were okay with it. Yeah. They ended up okay with it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it just, in my mind, even if they weren't okay, mm -hmm. it just was something about him that I had to follow. Amazing. I had to follow. That's good. So let's talk a little bit about follow. So you leave everything family fishing boat all of that you start following what what were those early days like uh, 
so like they tell stories of men of God in the Bible like they mm -hmm. tell you know Moses Elijah Elisha like mm -hmm. the stories mm -hmm. this guy was doing some ridiculous stuff yeah I mean demons being cast out mm -hmm. people coming back to life mm -hmm. I mean I, there was a story he kicked some family out of the room and like mm -hmm. The girl gets up out of the bed. Wow. I mean, just this type of stuff following him was ridiculous. Best time of my life. That's Best amazing. time of my life. I bet. So you, you make this journey. Uh, and it's interesting because many of the stories seem to be the same uh, of people who have encountered Jesus. There's this mm -hmm. reality where you leave everything. And it's interesting because people on the outside looking in would look at your story and say, you've lost your mind you know how are you gonna how are you gonna be provided for and you know and people have this picture of what your life ought to be you know and I don't know if you had to deal with any of that pressure of people's expectations of what you should be but from what I'm gathering from your story I don't hear any regret of leaving because it seems that you left what you were mm -hmm. and started this journey of becoming who God always intended you to be. Yep. Yep. I had no doubt in my mind. Wow. That's where I needed to be. Wow. Period. So you followed it. I did. Amen. Peter would go on to follow Jesus from synagogues to mountainsides. Peter had a front row seat to watch Jesus' fame spread throughout Syria, Judea, Decapolis, Galilee, and Samaria. Peter was present as Jesus performed miracle after miracle. He witnessed Jesus prove his authority over death when he saw Lazarus, the literal walking dead, step out of his grave clothes, and again when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, the original sleeping beauty, from her deathbed. Peter even welcomed Jesus into his own home and watched as Jesus healed his sick mother-in-law of her fever. He watched Jesus touch the untouchables and speak to the outcast of society, forever impacting their lives. Peter did not just watch Jesus perform miracles, but he became a part of them. He experienced multiplication mania as loaf after loaf passed through his hands when Jesus miraculously turned a small meal of fish and loaves into a feast for thousands. Peter was the only disciple to share a walk on the water with Jesus. Peter became one of Jesus' most trusted disciples, top three actually. He had a backstage pass on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus met with Moses and Elijah. Let's take a peek as Peter recounts the life-altering conversation with Jesus that became the defining moment of his life. So, Peter, I've been reviewing this conversation um, mm -hmm. that you, you mentioned before. You said that it was somewhat of a defining moment for you. Yeah. I want you to take a moment. Let's talk about this particular conversation that you had with Jesus. Okay, so... We were, we were coming in, us, him, and all of us, disciples, and he just like out of nowhere just goes, who do men say that I am? And so, you know, other guys, they were kind of like, oh, Elijah, second coming, you know. But for me, it was like this, like I just knew he was the Christ. Like, mm -hmm. you're just not anybody. You are the son of the living God. Wow. And out of that conversation, though, I had never had this happen before. He, he changes my name. Mm. And it mm, that did something for me. Wow. And uh, he just said off of that revelation, you know, uh, keys to the kingdom and all this different stuff. And I had never had that happen. And I, I just, and, and now where it started. Well, so one... One conversation. So you guys are walking and everybody else is giving answers. He turns around and says, who do you say that I am? And you just, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Tell me this. How did you know? How did you know that he was the Christ? I just knew. Wow. It just like something in me just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard to explain. He said it like. No man could have told you that. And yeah. Jesus said, my father in heaven revealed it. Wow. So, I mean, I, don't, I it wasn't a whole bunch of lights and angels. I just know 
when he asked me that I knew who he was. You knew he was. I knew who he was. Wow. So from this, this, this real place. So, all right. So then he responds to you. I'm going to change your name. Yeah. Right. And then he tells you, you said he, he gives you these keys of authority and access and wow. And then, then he's, you know, I'm going to build my church upon this revelation, all of this. Then, then tell me more. What, what, what happens after you have this revelation? Okay. All right, doc. Touching some places. Uh, okay. It take it takes a weird turn mm-hmm. at that point. Um, he then his his he starts changing a little bit. Mm-hmm. He starts talking about how he's going to be offered up mm-hmm. and how he was going to be treated once we got into Jerusalem. Well, and I didn't take too kind of that. Okay, and to be honest, I rebuked him. Mm. I. I had something to say about it. The Christ. Yeah, like, I, I know okay. that sounds bad, but I okay. had something to say. Like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. You do not need to talk like this. Yeah. We will not let this happen. And I thought I was doing the, you know, I don't want you to go through that. Mm-hmm. But he rebukes me. Mm. And he, he even goes as far as to be like, Satan, get behind it. I'm like, well, we just went from Peter, now I'm Satan. And mm-hmm. I got it wrong. And wow. it, that was tough. So let me ask you this. When, when he rebukes you and, and says, get thee behind me, Satan. And he's mm-hmm. just giving you this new name, right? Yeah. And, and he rebukes you. And I, I know this is, we mentioned, you know, in our previous conversation that that, that was an area that was, was kind of tough for you. Kind of a, a tough moment where you go from this revelation to a rebuke in a matter of moments. Yeah. You know, how do you feel when he, when he says this to you? You get this rebuke. How, how do you feel? Well, it's the Christ. So... This is my, the guy I'm following, yeah. my teacher, my master. Mm-hmm. The son of the living God calls me Satan. Well, wow. And whew, that does something to me. Yeah. That I don't know. I don't, I, I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't yeah. ready for that response. Like, I, yeah. I don't well, know. Let's, let's ask this. Let's, let's kind of dig into this situation. Um, what made you rebuke him? I, to be honest, I can't really put a finger on it other than just, I don't want, I, he shouldn't have to go through that. Yeah. He shouldn't have had to to go through those things. And then he just, it was out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're healing people. We're, he's healing everybody he walks yeah. across. And now all of a sudden he's talking about leaving. Mm. And I just was not feeling it. I, I was not on that train. Yeah. So as we process this, you know, it's important to understand, you know, the feelings that you might have felt, um, the various fears that you might have faced as you considered following him. Um, I wanna, I'm going to ask you this. Okay. You left everything to follow him. Um, no doubt it brought criticism for many people who didn't understand it. Yeah. Walked away from your occupation, uh, separated from your family. Do you think there was a part of you that feared that if I'm following him and this happens to him, then who's to stop that same kind of suffering and crucifixion from happening to me? To be honest, I I haven't really considered that. Hmm. But I, I feel the words of you. I did leave everything. When I think back, yeah. I left everything for him. Yeah. For him to leave, that's heavy. Yeah. And no doubt that would have affected your reputation because now this yeah. man that you've claimed to be the Christ and done all this for yeah. is now murdered at the hands of men and that would affect you. But you know, I was thinking, I'm looking back through the notes and the things that 
you said that he mentioned to you, he says, if, if any man is going to follow me, he says he has to first deny himself. And so it seems that he was speaking to you in that moment and saying, hey, there are going to be some parts of you that in following me, you've got to deny what you want and how you feel hmm. so that you can follow. Because our first law, one of our first laws is self-preservation. We want to keep ourselves from pain and agony and suffering. It's like we're doing good and we're blessing people and we're changing lives. Of course, we'll never go through that. And Jesus seems to reveal to you that to follow him, you're going to have to deny yourself. And then he, remember he says to you, and you're going to have to take up your cross. Yeah. And yeah. follow. Meaning that there's going to be a cross for every single believer to carry. There's going to be a cost. There's a price that comes with it. And sometimes we want to preserve our lives. But sometimes the only way to gain the life that is intended for us is to lose the one we have. And perhaps Jesus was revealing to you that there is a reward coming but there's going to be a risk and the risk is worth the reward I understand the pressure of that and the thought of going through that moment was excruciating it was agonizing to see and even consider the thought that this person that you love so dearly and were following so closely was going to be crucified but it all turns out well in the end but we just have to embrace the pressures of the moment. While Peter would never forget this pivotal moment, he pushed it to the back recesses of his mind and continued to pursue ministry with Jesus. Then it came. The day he swore would never happen. He denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. The rooster's crow still echoed in his ears. He could feel the words still leaving his him. mouth. I don't, I don't know him. I swear, I don't know him. <laughs> Doc, I can't, I can't talk about this one. He told me I didn't think I ever would do that. The worst mistake of my life. And I cannot get that rooster out of my head. That was not supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen. You know, Peter, when you decided to follow Jesus, he made you a promise. He told you that if you would follow him, then he would make you. And the reality is, is that none of us who have ever received that invitation, not you, not others, not anyone, has ever been what they were going to be when they started. And so while he made the promise, the promise came with a process. You know, and, and, and sometimes you felt like, well, I left everything. That was enough sacrifice. That was enough. But, but the process involves pressure. And sometimes it is possible to be in the middle of the plan of God for your life and experience pressure. Peter... I want to say this to you because I know that that was the lowest moment of your life, but I don't want you to stay there. I want you to understand that that in that moment, he, he had felt the pressure of the world coming on him. And, and because you're close, you feel that pressure coming on you. You feel the moment my life is at stake. Things are changing. There's 
there's this is a crisis I've never seen anything like this my world is being turned upside down and 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 and, and what is normal going to be like after three and a half years of following this man I want you to know Peter that that you were experiencing a pressure that 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 was indescribable, a pressure that you could not have even imagined on your best or worst day. And, and every single person that will be made into who God wants them to be is going to have to go through pressure. Pressure. But remember, Peter, what he said to you. He said, Peter, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat. But remember what he said? I pray for you. And he never said that he prayed that you wouldn't fail, but he said he prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. And sometimes under the pressure of circumstances and crisis, we'll all fail. We'll all make mistakes. We'll all miss the moment. Even the strongest one, I'll never, I'll never reject you. I'll never deny you. Every one of us will encounter the right amount of pressure. We start to realize that we may not be as strong as we thought we were. You know, every promise has a price. And I want you to understand, Peter, that what you saw that day was the price that he was paying for who you're going to be and who you're going to become. You know, that price that he paid, I, I, I know that it had to be excruciating to watch him bleed in front of you. I know it had to be excruciating to to watch that and then to know what you did. But I want you to know, Peter, it was a part of the price. The pain, the suffering, the anguish was a part of the price so that you would no longer have to be who you were, but you could become who he promised you that you would be. Peter, it's just a part of the process. It's a part of the pressure. It's a part of the price. Jesus' body remained in the tomb for three days, and as promised, on the third day was raised. Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken from the tomb and ran to tell Peter and John. They ran together to the tomb where they saw the linen cloths and handkerchief lying there. Clothes, but no body. Jesus made appearances over the next four days' time, revealing and showing himself alive, speaking peace and building faith. Jesus was resurrected, but Peter was not yet restored. So tell me this, how did you find out Jesus had been resurrected? So me and John, we kind of headed in that direction, kind of pay our respects. And then it was Mary, mm -hmm. and she comes running up and is like, He's no longer there. Well, wow. he's gone. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that's how we found out. That's how I found out. Well, so no doubt this has been an emotional three days for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything that has happened, everything that's transpired. And now you hear that Jesus has gotten up. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? First thing that comes to my mind, he pulled it off. <laughs> he pulled it off. He... Okay. <laughs> Either Mary, because Mary don't joke like that. Not yeah. about Jesus. Not Absolutely. about. He did it. Mm. That was my life. Oh, he really got up. He really got up. And so we just, we take off running. So your next move is. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll yeah. Go. We got we to gotta get there. I got to go see this for myself. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, Talk about it a little bit. So me and John take off. John's a little faster than I am. He got that first. And, and a little younger. Uh, yeah, we could say that. A couple that. years, decades. Yeah. And so, he's there. For whatever reason, he didn't want to go in. Mm -hmm. So, I go in. He comes behind me. And there's nothing there. Nothing. After the beatings, after just linen cloths. Wow. Nothing there. Wow. So, you go to the tomb. What is going through your mind as you are standing in this empty tomb where you know he was laying and he's not there? What's going through your mind as you stand 
in the empty tomb. My first thought was, yeah, yes, yeah, he's back. Well, but then my second thought, we never got to talk about what I did. When he rebuked me, we kind of got over that. But we never got, he prophesied about me denying him and we, we never got a chance. I never got a chance to get that right. Well, and that was my first thought. Like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Don't so know you, you don't him. really don't know, know where you stand. I don't know. Yeah. The last time you've seen him is the look that he gives yeah. as you've denied him well. Hmm. And so... After this moment, obviously, you know, we, we know that he is gone and he's revealing himself and he's walking into, getting, coming into rooms without walking through the door, climbing yeah. through the windows and all of this. And so while he's showing himself alive to everyone else, obviously it sounds like there's still a void in you. There's still this yeah. discomfort you're feeling because you've not quite addressed this breach in your relationship with him. Yeah. So then what happens for you? So I know this may seem weird. But I just went back to fishing. Hmm. I, I, it was what I was good at. Mm -hmm. At least I thought. Yeah. That's all I, my mind, that's all I had left. Just wow. go back to fishing. Wow. You know, it's not really un uncommon in moments where our lives are in an uproar, we're experiencing pressure, we're dis, dissatisfied, unsettled in our souls, to go back to what we're comfortable, and what's common to us, or even sometimes what we think gives us a semblance of success, right? And so sometimes fishing is not really about fishing as much as it is I've lost everything I love, mm -hmm. so let me go back to something that gives me a win. For, for some people, it's not fishing. For some people, it's, it's, it's alcohol. For some people, it's uh, relationships. For some people, it's other habits and other struggles in their lives um, that is kind of the thing that they go to to somewhat medicate the pain. Feel the void. It's like, all right. And, and sometimes when we don't see a future, we revert to our past. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So you go fishing and are you by yourself or do the other guys go with you? Uh, the other guys are with me. You know, mm -hmm. I take my brother. Yeah. He goes with me. So we, we just go back out. Wow. Just go back to it. And um, Why do you think they went with you? Because they didn't have the exact same situation, right? I mean, you know, leading maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it seemed like I was really confident in it. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Gotcha. They just. Or perhaps you're a leader, and yeah. even at your lowest point, you're still a leader. Yeah. Or perhaps you had some brothers who really love you. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you had some brothers who saw beyond the smile, said, man, Peter's in a struggle right now. You know, because sometimes when we're in that uncomfortable place of personal crisis, we need some people who will just keep us company. Like, they don't have to have all the answers. They don't have to figure it all out. But sometimes I just need some people, everybody. And, and I just think you're blessed that you have brothers with you. I agree. You know, that would go. So, all right. So you, you go back to fishing. All right. You guys are out there on the water. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Tell me what happens. So we're out there. You know, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. Started my business there. Started entrepreneuring and all that good stuff. And mm -hmm. this guy mm -hmm. just, hey, y'all catch anything out there? You know. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, we ain't caught nothing all day. Well, you know, it's a waste of time. We ain't caught nothing. Mm -hmm. And then John goes, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, that's all he had to tell me. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I had kind of, you know, fixed myself up to go fishing. I put yeah. on my shirt, all that good stuff, and I just jumped straight in the water. Yeah. I, I, be, I bet it reminded you of the first time you met him. Yep. yep. When you had caught nothing. Mm. But yet he comes, gives one instruction, changes the outcome of your life. So, yeah. You jump out? What? <laughs> I, yeah, I just jump straight in the water. I'm like, and you're headed to forget him. the boat, forget the fish. Wow! I get to. This is my shot. This is my yeah. time to make it right. To make it right. And then what happens? Uh, so I get there. Oh, no, I, I'll be honest. He started asking me some questions. I'm not really sure. Even to this day. Yeah. What all it kind of meant or why he even asked me those series of questions. But he just kept, kept asking, do I love him? Yeah. Do I love him? And, uh, and then you would, you would answer. I, yes, of course I love him. And he did it like three times. And then I'll be honest, that last time I was like, listen, you, you Jesus, you know all things. Yeah. Of course you know I love you. Like, wow. yeah. And you know, it was a little frustrating, but. I want to speak to that just for a moment, you know. Um, I first of all find it fascinating that he knew where to find you. Mm. That when you went back to fishing, he knew where to find you. Mm. Um, it's interesting how Jesus always knows where to find you. Yeah. Um, that thing you want to go back to, he'll find you right there in it. That thing you want to run and retreat to, he'll always find you in it. But then, you know, I've been, I've had a few moments to look through questions that he asked you and I I reviewed your answers and he asked you Peter do you love me and he said yeah you know I love you and he says well, feed my sheep and in other words he's you're thinking about your failure and he's thinking about your future you're thinking about what you did wrong and he's saying but Peter you can make this right I still have a plan for you then he asked you again, do you love me? And he was like, Lord, I love you. And, and like you said the third time he asked, but I don't know if you noticed, but the last time you said it was different than the first two times you answered. Mm -hmm. Because when you answered the first two times, you were saying, yes, Lord, I, you know, I love you like a friend. I, I, I like you like this is, you know, but, but sometimes that level of love can't stand the weight of crisis and pressure. But you know, the last time you answered, you said, I love you. And that was a different kind of love. That was a love of commitment. But you, you, you need to understand that that level of love didn't come from you. That level of love that you spoke from is not even possible until you realize how much he loves you. Mm. Peter, Jesus was never surprised by your failure. He knew that in you, just like in me is not an ability to keep our commitment. And Peter, he couldn't trust you with your ultimate calling until you knew it wasn't you keeping your commitment to God. It was the fact that he was going to keep his commitment to you. And so at the moment that you were able to say, I love you. And you were able to say, I love you with the love that will give up everything i love you with a love that's that will sacrifice it all for your will and for your plan you're saying to him i love you because you showed me how you showed me you redefined what love was you know peter i just want you to know that you may have been at your lowest moment but you made it to the other side and you're about to see the greatness of his plan because now you understand that what he did for you on that cross was really about his love for you, really about his unwavering commitment. And now you can serve him beyond your failure because your faith is not in your ability to do, to do it right. But it's in his ability to keep you. And one day, I want to encourage you with this. One day, your story, what you've learned, giving up everything from going from revelation to rebuke in a matter of moments everything you learn from even the shame of feeling like you crumbled under the pressure messed up one day 
Your story is going to be used to give hope to someone else who will one day sit where you're sitting right now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to talk to somebody. I want you in your mind, in your heart. I want you to speak to someone who may be at that place one day. I want you to talk to them. Matter of fact, talk to them like you would talk to you. Like you would talk to yourself. I want you to talk to yourself from the other side. So for some of you who may be watching, you may have made the worst mistake in your life. And you may have done it publicly. But there are some words that are so beautiful that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. There is no dirt on your life. There is no mistake on your life. There is nothing you have done that does not make want God, that he does not want you. You are wanted from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You are called for this. You are not just a fisher of fish. You are not just a, a hairdresser. You are not just a school teacher. You are not just a principal, a nurse, a physician. You are a fisher of men. God has called you to call men. And your mistakes don't keep you from that. Um, and if you're ready right now, if you're wrestling, if you are wrestling with your past, if you are wrestling with what you've done, God is ready to help you lift that weight. God is ready to lift that weight off of your shoulders. God is ready to wash you and make you clean. God is ready to redeem you. God is ready to make you whole. And so I, I, I want to pray. I want to pray with you. Father, I thank you even now. For everyone watching, for everyone who has seen this story, God, I thank you that they are set free. That God, that they are not the total amount of their mistakes, but God, they are who you have called them to be. God, they are your children. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are a prophet. You are a pastor. You are a teacher. You are an evangelist. You are an apostle. You are called to this generation. We come against everything that has tried to keep Keep you in your past and keep you in your mistakes. You are not what you used to be. God, I thank you that we are free. God, I thank you that the spirit of freedom is flowing to your people. Even in this atmosphere, in this environment of where we are. God, I thank you that there is freedom. There is freedom for your people. Man of God, woman of God, get up. This is your time. This is your time to be who God has called you to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for the opportunity to declare the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. I know there are people watching us right now that just gave your life to Jesus. Here's what I need you to do because we are excited. We're thankful that you've come into the kingdom of God, but we know that you're just at the door. God has a whole new world prepared for you. So listen, I want you to click the link that's right there available to you and let us know so that we can follow up with you in your journey with God. We're so thankful that God has ministered to you today. Listen, there are people watching us now. We want to give you the opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God. We want to give you the opportunity. You know, what happened at the, at the cross was God sowed the seed of a son to reap a family of new believers. And so today I want to encourage you to sow a seed. If you're a member of our local congregation, we give our tithe. We believe in giving the tenth of our income to the kingdom of God so that God's work can go forward. To others, we give an offering, which is anything we give above the tithe. That's what we consider seed. Whenever there is seed in the ground, there's always a harvest guaranteed. And so I want you to follow the information right there on your screen. There are several ways for you to give. You can give through cash app, dollar sign, we are KVIC1. Or you can text to give right there from your living room. You can text the letters KVIC to the number 77977. Or you can go right there, which you need to do this anyway, and download our Kingdom Vision app and click give right there and you can give. Listen, this is also a time for Resurrection Seed. It's a time where we go over and above. 
Uh, everything we sow towards Resurrection Seed goes towards the completion of our debt-free Life Empowerment Center. So if you want to get a seed in the ground, this is a great time to do it. We love you. We're praying for you. Do me a favor. Share this experience. Just share it. Tag people in it so that we can get the gospel. I say that the body of Christ ought to break the internet. We ought to break records for the harvest of souls that comes in this Easter Sunday. We love you, and we'll see you next time.